Previously on Degrassi Junior High. Creepy old men who are creepy at our main characters. Part one, making of. I honestly don't think I'm going to be splitting this into parts, but here we go, part one. As I said at the end of the last video, Degrassi Junior High was ended with the intention of continuing the story of the characters in a show called Degrassi High, and they did just that. Honestly, it's hardly worth calling it a different show, as almost nothing but the setting has changed. Since they burned down Degrassi Junior High, they did have to move to a different campus to film. The new campus is pretty cool, but it's like the only real significant change. A new viewer could watch all of Degrassi Junior High and High under the sometimes used label of like Degrassi Classic or Degrassi Old School, and be almost totally unaware that anything has changed. The only other clue would be the new theme song and logo. Because of this, I'm just not gonna delve that deeply into production like I did last time. If you want more info on that, there's a bit in my last video and not much changed between the two series as far as I can tell. The teenage cast members were still dressing themselves for the most part. And according to an interview some members of the cast did at the time, they still participated in ideas discussions and gave their inputs on the scripts. This interview that I'm referencing also reveals that Ste Stefan, Stefan. This interview also reveals that Stefan, who played Archie, got to choose between the nicknames Snake or Slim for his character way back in the beginning in Degrassi Junior High. And while learning this, I was briefly warped into an alternate reality where Snake is called Slim, and I just like, I had to sit down for a moment. For the most part, the production team continued to remain the same, though a couple of writers would start taking more of the reins as the series went on. Some of the writers, such as Susan Nielsen, the author of the Snake book that y'all kept raving about in my comments last time, would go on to write for another series, Degrassi The Next Generation, which I just noticed because I've already started my Next Generation rewatch, so. Another thing that changed in the production was the theme song, as I mentioned before. This fact is always jarring to me on rewatch because even though the theme song is very similar, like the melody is identical, it's off enough to put it into this weird, uncanny valley. It's just different enough to feel like the version of the song that you'd find in like a dream. The key has changed and some of the lyrics are weirdly disjointed and oddly structured. There's this line, Everybody can succeed in yourself. You must believe. Give it a try. No one speaks this way. It makes no sense. Everybody can succeed in yourself. You must believe. Anyway. They kept the ending theme about the same though, so we still have that madness to look forward to when the credits roll. And that's really all there is to say about that, so let's move on. Season 1. Okay, so this time I'm going to try and break this down more or less chronologically. Last time I bounced all over the place and that was mostly out of necessity. The storylines in Degrassi Junior High were kind of all over the place themselves and happened out of any kind of recognizable forward moving narrative, which I mentioned a few times in my last video as the show Leaving Things Hanging. That continues to be the case in this series as well, though I do think there's more of a narrative through line for seasons. This method of storytelling actually did start popping up in season three of Junior High, but this is the series where they really decided to commit to it. This method of storytelling would become one of the things that Degrassi is known for further down the line. And now someone's mowing. So, great. Because of this, I'm going to break this up into seasons. I'm still not going to be able to cover all storylines, issues, and just like one-off fun episodes, but I'll throw in a lightning round like I did at the end last time just to talk about things that don't fit anywhere else. So season one starts out with a bang by making its issue of the week teen pregnancy. Again. This time, it's one of the twins, Erica. I only mentioned she's one of the twins because as usual with their storylines, the writers take the opportunity of there being two of them to contrast opposing viewpoints. This is not uncommon. In Degrassi Junior High, they often use Erica and Heather to highlight two sides of an issue, with Erica being the more wild, outgoing one, and Heather being the more conservative and realistic. Over the summer, Erica hooked up with a guy who turned out to be a total jerk, of course, and ends up getting pregnant. A side note here is the home pregnancy tests of the 80s, which to my modern eyes looks like a mad scientist kit and apparently takes an hour to give results, making me super grateful for how far we've come. But the main point of contention between the twins is abortion. Basically, Erica wants one and Heather, Heather disagrees? Like, so look, I made a big point in my last video about Degrassi's big mandate about showing teen lives as they are without moralizing and talking down to them. And I think most people who have watched all of Degrassi up through next class will agree that at some point they 
kind of lost the drive to do that. But where exactly they lost it is up for debate. And each person probably has a different episode that they could point to. Mine is somewhere in the next generation. If you're curious, though, we can talk more about that when we get there. I was actually surprised in my research to discover that back in the 90s, some people thought that this episode was where they dropped the ball and started moralizing at the audience. I think that probably has to do with the way they address the issue and the particular framing that they gave it. The show spends a lot of time on the argument about a woman's right to choose. A number of different characters hold opinions for very different reasons. For example, Lucy believes it to always be a feminist issue, while some people think it's acceptable, but only some of the time. Spike, a character who carried a pregnancy to term and chose to raise the baby herself, is shown to also believe in the right to choose, which is a surprise to some of her classmates, as she didn't make that choice for herself. But she emphasizes that the right choice for some may not be the right choice for others, and she believes in that choice existing. The opposing side is mostly made up of Heather and Liz. As usual, Heather is framed mostly as conservative, but reasonable, and Liz, who I mentioned last time as being the insufferable SJW stereotype long before that acronym even existed, vandalizes Erica's locker with the word murderer, which causes Erica to basically have a breakdown in the hallway. Erica does eventually go through with terminating her pregnancy, and more importantly, her sister Heather supports her decision, at least more than she did, helping her walk through a line of protesters at the clinic. I think this right here actually is why some people find it preachy, but I honestly love this solution, especially because it doesn't end here. Like, Erica, for the most part, seems to experience what most women claim to experience after having an abortion, which is primarily relief and gratefulness that they had the option. However, in later episodes, Heather is the one who has a hard time with her twin's abortion. She has nightmares about walking Erica into the clinic and becomes paranoid that Erica is going to sleep with a new guy that she's seeing later in the season, which will cause the whole thing to repeat itself. The idea that this is a thing that's going to happen again and she's going to have to participate in again causes her a lot of stress. So with this storyline, Degrassi basically planted their flag and said, look, we're mature now. We're covering mature topics. It's easy to look back at this now and think that an abortion storyline maybe isn't all that edgy or groundbreaking, but it actually was contentious at the time, with the American PBS versions of the episode cutting out the scenes with the pro-life protesters, a choice which highly irritated Degrassi creators. The next few storylines in the first season play out over a couple of episodes. Michelle's parents get a divorce, Caitlin starts dating this new guy named Claude, and the Zit Remedy, newly rebranded as the Zits, plan and film a music video. Michelle's storyline is, at least in part, a continuation of one that started last season, specifically her parents' reaction to her dating BLT who is black. So in this story, Michelle's mom finally decides to leave her dad, which everyone thinks is kind of for the best. Her dad is controlling, sexist, and as I mentioned, obviously racist as well. It's kind of mentioned that he won't let Michelle's mom pursue any work or education outside of the home. So like, I have to say, I agree with Michelle's mom for her choice. But Michelle is split between being there for her dad, who she feels needs someone to take care of him, Yuck, and her mom, who did voluntarily leave her family to find a better life. Unable to find a satisfactory answer, eventually Michelle decides not to choose either and moves out of her house. She takes a job, finds a room in one of those giant houses with like 12 roommates that people move into in college, and starts taking care of herself. If not without its struggles, but for a while, this is Degrassi's first emancipation slash teenager living on their own story, which will become a recurring theme as the writers start to need characters to have a place to congregate without adult supervision. Even though technically Michelle isn't emancipated here, she's just at the legal age of majority in Canada. She's just like allowed to move out and so she does. Unlike later seasons though, I think this actually shows a more grounded look at emancipation, showing the struggles but also freedom and independence that it can bring for those who can handle it. As I said before, Degrassi loves emancipated minors and other storylines involving kids living free from their parents, but they actually seldom showcase the reality of it. Emancipated minors are still minors and while those who get emancipated can legally live without an adult, they can't do a lot of things that adults can, like sign leases or work hours that can support them financially due to child labor laws. A huge percentage of emancipated teens are foster care kids, many of whom find themselves homeless in less than a year. Michelle doesn't have it easy, but like, to be honest, she really makes it work. And Degrassi won't show some of the true struggles of being a minor living on their own until later seasons. So next up is Caitlin and Claude. Oh my gosh, I actually have to talk about Caitlin and Joey now. Caitlin and Joey, 
corner. As I promised in the last video, here we are. Caitlin and Joey start having a thing in junior high. This is Caitlin. She's kind of a hippie do-gooder that the writers clearly love, develops a crush on Joey Jeremiah after he reaches out to her for help with schoolwork. This is Joey Jeremiah, by the way, in case it's been a while since you've seen the last video. He's a chronic big dreamer slash underachiever slash class clown type who failed eighth grade and ended up in Caitlin's class. He goes to her for help with his grades. He's not explicitly using her exactly, but he's in full-on oblivious boy mode and doesn't exactly notice that he's leading her on, flirting with her in order to get better grades, basically. <laughs> After a bit of a will-they-won't-they, they, the show finally commits and Joey and Caitlin become a thing. It's a genuinely cute little storyline and, with a few exceptions, realistically depicts the trials and tribulations of romance in middle school. In high school, though, everything is about to go off the rails. Things like Tumblr and Twitter didn't exist at the time, but my guess is Joey and Caitlin must have been pretty popular with the viewers. Or maybe they were just interesting to the writers. Or maybe the writers had no idea how to keep a couple interesting once they had started dating. Which actually, now that I say that, we know isn't true because hello Simon and Alexa. I love y'all. But I think they just decided to pull a Sam and Diane. Wait, <laughs> is my audience gonna get a Cheers reference? Um, they decided to pull a Ross and Rachel. Y'all watched Friends, right? I heard that Gen Z watched Friends. And decided to make the instability of their relationship the whole story. So like four episodes into season one of Degrassi High, Caitlin and Joey Jeremiah break up. It's portrayed as like one of those things that just happens in high school where you realize there's a trait that you find attractive in someone else that your partner just doesn't have. And suddenly the light just goes out. In this case, Caitlin's new guy, Claude, is passionate about art and activism. And suddenly Caitlin feels like that's missing from her relationship with Joey. They never explicitly say that exactly, but anyone who's lived through this kind of thing knows the feeling. It's very high school. Anyway, we're exiting Caitlin and Joey Corner for now, but don't worry, we'll be back. And as I mentioned before, the Zit Remedy makes a music video, but I'm actually going to talk more about that in the lightning round. So let's move on to Kathleen and her boyfriend. Content warning for physical and emotional abuse. Go to this timestamp or the next chapter to skip it. When we last left Kathleen, she was struggling with an alcoholic mother, an eating disorder, and I hinted that she was going to enter an abusive relationship. Surprise! I didn't lie. Kathleen becomes convinced that in high school, a boyfriend is essential. She keeps running into some girls in the hallway that she keeps having trouble with, these pushy girls that hang around her locker. But after a cute boy, Scott, asks her to the football game, she seems to gain some confidence and is able to stand up for herself. At a glance, this might seem like a good thing, I guess. But since it seems like Kathleen's newfound confidence has come from the validation and attention of a boy, we can kind of see the groundwork the show is setting. But it takes a few episodes for stuff to really hit the fan. Like all depictions of physical abuse in Degrassi, it comes out the gate at a hundred percent. I don't know why they always portray physical violence so, I guess, violently. There's no subtlety to it really, but I guess that's for the best. A few episodes after she starts dating Scott, we see him doing, you know, this. She's been dating him for a while now, so there's an implication that maybe this isn't the first time that Scott has done something like this, but uh, again, it's not clear. The rest of the episode lays out a sort of standard path for this sort of thing. Scott does whatever he can to keep Kathleen near him and within his control. He comforts her when she doesn't get into the school play, but then when she decides she wants to try out for another, he casually belittles her, saying her audition wasn't good and he just doesn't want her to embarrass herself. A common tactic used by emotional abusers whose main drives are to invalidate and isolate their victims in order to retain control. We also see a cycle of physical abuse followed by a grace period of gifts and apologies before returning to the status quo. Kathleen does decide not to try out for the play, but continues to practice her lines for English class with her English partner Luke behind Scott's back, knowing he would get jealous and overreact if he knew. Side note, this is Luke. I don't like him. Eventually, Scott does find out and totally loses control, calling her garbage and beating her in the classroom. It's after this incident, and I think some pushing from her friends, that Kathleen finally decides to leave him. But my favorite part of the story actually happens later. In a subplot in a random episode towards the end of the season, Scott is angry that Kathleen has been ignoring him and is pleased to make up, and hurts her again. The next day, she comes to school with her arm in a sling, and it's revealed that she pressed charges against him. When he tries to confront her about it, she tells him to shut up or she'll call the cops again. This is a, badass, and B, a realistic portrayal of how abusers attempt to regain control after losing it. Even though it seems as though Kathleen made a clean break from Scott in the earlier episode, it's not always that simple, and she was still endangered by him, even though they weren't dating. 
I also appreciate Kathleen being the character in this arc. As I said in the last episode, she's one of my favorite characters, but that's not the only reason. Even though her actress does bring an incredible amount of nuance and depth to this storyline, it probably actually could have been any character, but Kathleen has proven to be isolated at home and lonely. We've seen her struggle with her self-esteem, body issues, and how she's perceived by others. She is particularly vulnerable to this kind of predator, whether Degrassi High meant to portray it that way or not. LD gets cancer. I feel weird about this storyline. I kind of don't want to dunk on a storyline in which a teenager gets leukemia, but like, it isn't very good. I feel like they wanted to go somewhere with it, but instead, LD falls victim to the Degrassi trope of characters who go into the hospital, disappearing and never returning. Basically, LD completely disappears from the cast and we find out that she's really sick and Lucy keeps visiting her in the hospital. We do see her in the hospital from time to time and it's quickly revealed that she has leukemia. It's both greatly affecting and also super shallow. LD's reaction to finding out she has cancer is gut-wrenching. The actress here does some work. But because they only tell the story from Lucy's perspective, we really don't get to see what cancer does to LD's life or how she copes. Instead, we only get to see LD when Lucy sees LD, which leads to a sort of uncomfortable voyeuristic perspective, at least for me. Like with Shane last season, Degrassi treats illness and disability as something that teenagers have to deal with when it happens to other people people. And fair enough, as more people will have someone close to them get cancer than actually develop it themselves. I don't know. I just feel like the story is only half told. There are only a few episodes in which we see her in the hospital. And then when it's announced that she's in remission, it's from Lucy to her friends. Where is she? Keep rolling. Okay. I want to see their faces when they hear. Oh no, more cancer? No, she's gone into remission. Her hair has grown back and everything. That's great. But, That's great. But we never actually get to see LD's reaction to the news. Also, after LD is declared to be in remission, we never see her again. She sort of continues to exist in the storyline because Lucy makes videotapes to send to her as she and her dad travel the world or something, appreciating the beauty of this short life or whatever. Joey and Caitlin Corner 2, Electric Boogaloo. The last thing I really want to talk about for this season is Joey's story. Joey has been at the center of a lot of stories in season one, including Caitlin's, which is one of the reasons I'm lumping them together in the Joey and Caitlin corner. And he'll be in even more in season two, not to mention the movie, which yeah, we're going to talk about. But at the end of the season, we get to watch Joey as he continues to struggle with school. You may have picked up on this as a recurring theme in both series so far, as Joey was held back in his eighth grade year and is close to repeating the same thing here in ninth grade, even as he works hard and sees tutors. It's at this point in the story that Joey is finally tested and diagnosed with a learning disability. So Joey Jeremiah is diagnosed with dysgraphia. Dysgraphia is a learning disability that affects fine motor skills, writing, and in general, just kind of getting ideas onto paper in a structured and easily legible way. It can show up on its own or as a comorbidity with other learning disabilities or developmental disorders like autism and ADHD. The main meat of the story is actually not about Joey's disability itself, but about Joey's sudden shift in how he perceives himself with a disability and the struggle he has with having to take special education classes now. So for a sec, like, let's talk about special ed. Technically, special ed is intended to be a place where accommodations can be made for students who need them, but as for good or ill, they are often segregated from the rest of the school, especially during this time, they often carry a stigma. Those in special ed can be seen by other students as having lesser intelligence or even humanity, with special ed being thrown around as an insult back when I was in school, along with other things like short bus. Joey has internalized these ideas and decides that if he needs special education, he must be stupid, and decides to just leave school because if he's stupid, he can't learn anything anyway. It's only after talking to Caitlin in detention, who tells him he's not stupid, that he rethinks his decision. Caitlin is in detention, by the way, because she gave her ex-boyfriend a bloody nose. Okay, wait, let's back up. Last time we saw Caitlyn, she had started going out with Claude, the smart, funny, sensitive older guy she had a lot in common with. They both care about things like the environment and activism, and while this is a good basis for a relationship, it will also be their downfall. In All in a Good Cause, it is revealed that a nearby plant is going to start producing electronics that are going to be used in nuclear weapons. I've never been sure about this plot's realism. In 1989, Canada was a vocal proponent of disarmament, and I don't know that they would allow one of their factories to make these pieces, but I guess I could see something like this happening. I don't know. I don't know that much about the production of nuclear weapons. <laughs> 
Claude and Caitlin want to protest it, and eventually they land on the idea of spray painting anti-nuclear messaging on the factory walls. During their break-in, they're discovered by a security officer and have to scale a tricky fence. Claude makes it over, but Caitlin gets stuck. She asks him for help, but Claude... Look, he bails. And okay, look, I'm not a big supporter of the idea of cowardice as a concept. Sometimes people get freaked out and just react. You know, the idea of labeling someone forever as a person who gets easily scared just because of reacting in a situation like that has always seemed super harsh and rooted in weird ideas about masculinity and stuff. But I will say, <laughs> this kid was on the other side of the fence where the guard could not reach. He was not in any real danger of being caught and instead he left his girlfriend to take the heat. So, you know, not very punk rock. He's a teen, so I don't want to come down too hard on him. But the highest rated comment on the Degrassi official video sums it up pretty well. If it had been Joey, he never would have ran. Caitlin gets charged with trespassing, and when Claude refuses to take responsibility, they break up, obviously. But what lands Caitlin in detention is actually another altercation with Claude taking place later. So in this episode, Claude approaches her saying that he just wants to make up. She says that he can do so by coming to her court appearance for trespassing, which she doesn't want him to do to like testify or anything, but just to back her up and serve as moral support because otherwise she's going to have to go alone. But he refuses, arguing that the security guard might recognize him. Caitlin is, kind of understandably, disgusted, and when she tries to walk away, Claude grabs her arm and she bucks back at him, accidentally bloodying his nose in the process. And so that's how detention happens and how Caitlin ends up encouraging Joey to stay in school. Overall, I really like where Caitlin and Joey's stories are allowed to go when they aren't tied to each other. It's also sweet the way they continue to support each other throughout the seasons, even when they aren't dating. Caitlin telling Joey he's smart not to drop out of school is really nice, and it makes sense that that manages to convince Joey since he thinks very highly of her. Joey's storyline wraps up with him going into special education with a character named Dwayne, a character who is going to be instrumental in season two. Intermission. So here between the seasons, I want to do something different and showcase a couple of the best and worst outfits of the series in something that I'm going to call Degrassi Fashion Corner. Yeah, everything's a corner in this episode, okay? I'm, I'm not original when it comes to making up titles. The outfits in this show continue to both confuse and excite me, and I wanted to highlight a few. I'm sure this will continue into the future as characters in the next generation make some frankly iconic outfit choices, but for now, let's just enjoy the late 80s, early 90s fits. Lucy Fernandez. Notable outfits, like all of them. Lucy is a style inspiration, and nothing she wears is bad. In Degrassi Junior High, she had two incredible signature jackets that I am obsessed with, one of which appears in Degrassi High a few times. Lucy likes to rock florals, blazers, and homemade personalized sweatshirts from time to time. Snake. Notable outfits, patterned button-down shirts. I want all of them, but my favorites are the pencil shirt here and this one with, look, the first time I saw it, I thought it was fruit, but now I don't know. I don't know what this is. The patterns are so colorful and quintessentially 90s, and they add so much to Snake's characterization as a clueless goofball. I just love it. Tim, notable outfits, king of tie-dye. I just love this whole vibe. Effortlessly cool, relaxed, chilling on a weekend vibe. So good. Spike. Notable outfits, this skirt, which appears constantly, and for some reason, I'm convinced that the actress made it herself. I don't know why, it just looks very DIY, and I'm into it. Claude. Notable, his whole deal. <laughs> So look, I said I was also going to talk about the worst, and I don't want to put down anyone's stuff because, again, I'm pretty sure the kids were still mostly dressing themselves, <laughs> but these looks are a lot. I appreciate the effort, Claude. I truly do. The facial hair is definitely no longer in the realm of what's popular nowadays, if it ever was, but I dig parts of it, maybe. It lives in that realm between love and hate where I'm having a very strong reaction to it that could flip in either direction at any time, and you gotta respect that kind of boldness. Tessa Campanelli, notable. Her entire summer vibes and school's out. This is an honorable mention, which goes to Tessa, who is living my summer goals with all of her outfits in this movie, which we'll get to later. Sorry if there were any outfits that I missed. <laughs> I just wasn't taking notes on any of these, but trust me when I say that I will for the next series. Let me know about favorite outfits when they appeared if I missed them. Before leaving intermission, I also want to say one more thing. I want to talk about something exciting. I passed 13,000 subs as I'm writing this, and uh, that's really incredible, and I wanted to say thank you so much. But lately, it's becoming clear that these longer videos, as much as I love making them, they take up a lot of time, and a few of them, like the Degrassi and Babysitter's Club ones, they just can't be monetized. So uh, I wanted to announce that I'm starting a Patreon for those those of you who just want to support 
this kind of content if you can. You'll get early access to all of my videos, polls, and even some bonus content. For example, um, the first one that I'm going to be uploading is a rambling off the cuff video I made talking about the Degrassi novelization Snake, in which Snake comes to term with both his brother's sexuality as well as his own. It's totally unscripted, just me giving my opinion on the book, uh, but if you are interested, you can go over to Patreon and check that out. And even if you can't, I just want to say thank you so much for watching and subscribing. Thank you everyone for supporting me so far and getting us to 13,000. Okay, I've been recording for a while and uh, we are not close to done, so we need to move through this a little faster. So I'm going to sum up some storylines real quick. The first one, which is also the book ender of this season, is Dwayne's. So I haven't mentioned Dwayne before now, which is 100% my bad. I really should have, but here's a primer. He showed up in a couple of episodes in Degrassi Junior High. Mostly he and Joey kind of face off against each other. The main episode is the one in which he and Joey get into a fight. I didn't mention it in the last video because it's just kind of a weird episode. It shows Joey Jeremiah struggling with whether or not to fight Dwayne and ends up framing him choosing to do it as though it's like he overcame his fear, which is okay, fair. He did do that, but ultimately it's kind of weird to me, a millennial who was raised on violence is never the answer media, even though I do think sometimes violence can be the answer. It's just weird to see that in my children's media. When the characters entered Degrassi High, Dwayne and his squad partook in a bit of hazing, leading to a reign of terror that ended with Joey's the final holdout, kind of running away and narrowly escaping getting bullied by these kids, refusing to be harassed. This, plus his history with Dwayne, led to Joey being the target of that group's ire throughout much of the series. In the first episode of season two, Dwayne discovers that he has contracted HIV from a girl he met over the summer. So abruptly, the show asks us to sympathize with a character we don't know very well, who has mostly been framed by his opposition to the closest thing Degrassi has to a main protagonist. It's this intense shift and is actually executed really well, working in part due to the actor's skill and the writer's abilities to add depth and subtlety to the situation. One of the things I like about it is that Dwayne doesn't suddenly change to make it easier for the audience to sympathize with him. And in fact, he will continue to harass Joey even in the episodes in which we are finding out about his diagnosis, leading to Joey losing a bet with about a dozen people all over school that he makes in order to obtain a car. It's a whole thing. He's like, to walk naked through the hallway and because of Dwayne he gets caught doing so. Come with me please. Joey confronts Dwayne about this a few weeks later after Dwayne has received his diagnosis. Like the pregnancy tests in season one, I am again reminded how privileged we are to get quick HIV test results without having to wait for weeks like poor Dwayne did. Joey demands Dwayne pay him for the bet he lost since it was Dwayne's fault that he lost in the first place, which is true. I mean, Dwayne was actively trying to sabotage the bet. This leads to a fist fight in the Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets ass bathroom and both boys get bloodied up. Dwayne reacts strongly to this when he sees his own blood, warning Joey to stay away if he doesn't want to catch HIV. Joey is understandably shocked by this revelation. Dwayne's story is going to continue throughout the season, with his and Joey's relationship occasionally taking center stage. Dwayne eventually did pay Joey at the end of the two-parter, though it reads more like hush money so that he'll keep quiet about Dwayne's secret. Later, when his friends realize he's been going soft on Joey, they wonder if he's being blackmailed. This leads to one of my favorite moments in the whole show, in the episode Crossed Wires. Joey is working on his car, which is on the fritz. It's always on the fritz. <laughs> Joey's car is terrible, which is a running plot point throughout this season, as you'll see later, and Dwayne offers his help. They chat, and eventually the conversation turns to the diagnosis, and Dwayne mentions that he thinks of game-overing himself since he figures he's dead anyway. Joey argues with him about that and says that he should tell his parents. You gotta tell them. <sighs> no way. My dad would kill me. You wouldn't have to do it yourself. Oh, man, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to say that. I say these stupid things sometimes. No. That's okay. I like it. It's kind of funny. So I love this scene. I could talk about it forever. As far as we know, because Dwayne has been keeping this a secret from literally everybody but Joey and his doctor, this is the first moment that Dwayne has been able to find humor in anything relating to his situation. Being HIV positive in the 90s was not a laughing matter, but an important moment in everyone's healing, whether it's physical or emotional, is sort of being able to laugh at it. It loses some of its power, and maybe it helps Dwayne feel like people aren't all going to treat him differently if they find out. I don't know, maybe I'm trying too hard to find a justification for this. Maybe it's just I'm a 
millennial and we're known for jokes about wishing we weren't alive, but I just love this scene, y'all. It's a great moment in an episode that's actually otherwise super intense and hard to laugh at, which actually leads us to Liz. I've mentioned Liz a couple of times before, but I just want to say that while I usually sum her up as the insufferable SJW of the show, she's actually much more than that. Liz has depth, and I could honestly see her being some people's favorite character. She's believable and three-dimensional in the way that characters like Kathleen and Wheels are, which also means that she's flawed and interesting. So there are a couple of things about the episode Crossed Wires. First of all, I think it's in a weird spot chronologically. That is, it doesn't actually make sense being broadcast when it was. Crossed Wires immediately immediately follows an episode called Body Politics, in which Patrick, Spike's ex-boyfriend, asks Liz out. In it, they portray Liz's only issue with saying yes as being the bro code, you know, not saying yes to her best friend's ex. However, in the very next episode, Liz reacts as if the very concept of dating a boy frightens her. I don't know what the production order on this was, but I think the episodes are better enjoyed if they're flipped. It just makes more sense that way. So if you're gonna go through and watch this for whatever reason, uh, watch Body Politics after Crossed Wire. The next thing I have to say is a uh, content warning, y'all. This next part is going to talk about child sexual abuse in the vaguest of terms, but if you don't want to hear anything about it, skip to this timestamp or the next chapter. So as you may have guessed, in this episode, Liz opens up about her mom's ex-boyfriend sexually abusing her as a child. The episode starts out with her having a dream about the events and then later at school being asked out by Tim. By the way, this is Tim. You saw him in the fashion breakdown. I love him. I think he's a genuine sweetheart, even though he accidentally triggers Liz by misreading her body language here and going in for a kiss. There's been some criticism for Tim of this scene, but honestly, like, I can see why he misread this. I can see why he thought, oh yeah, let's do it. I would have loved to see more of him. We just didn't get nearly enough Tim. Anyway, after his date with Liz ends pretty disastrously, he spends the rest of the episode asking Liz and her friends for an explanation of her behavior as he rightfully guesses that something else was going on that more than meets the eye. I just get the genuine feeling from this that he really wanted to know what he had done to freak her out so much. In the end, he actually never finds out what happened, but Liz does open up and reveals the truth to Spike. She tells her that after years of abuse and being told that she would never be believed, she did finally tell her mom, who promptly left her boyfriend and moved Liz to a new school. Way to go, mom. So when Liz showed up in Degrassi Junior High, that was them moving to get away from her abuser. This means that at the time of telling Spike, Liz has only been out of that situation for about three years, so the trauma is still very fresh for her. Later seasons of Degrassi will also attempt to deal with child sexual abuse in their own way, and while I remember thinking that they did, like, a decent job, I really like this episode. It's mostly understated, aside from flashbacks, which, again, is Degrassi going over the top a little bit, but also I feel like these were always going to feel over the top and rough. Any actual depictions of adults being creepy at children is just going to be hard. Claude. All right, so we just jumped out of one content warning, and uh, here's another one. This episode discusses suicide. Again, it's in the vaguest of terms, but if you want to skip for any reason, here's the timestamp. This is a two-parter, and when I watched it on YouTube, I was greeted with Joey and Caitlin to give me a warning about the subject matter and lecture me about game-overing. I imagine that it aired with these clips. I mean, it's meant to be thoughtful and prevent the kind of thing that 13 Reasons Why dealt with when they portrayed it in their show, but something about these little bookends strikes a weird tone. This part in particular always makes me laugh. We all get depressed sometimes, but nobody needs to kill themselves. Pat just sounds so exasperated here, like, come on, guys. Suicide? Aren't we being a little dramatic? Nobody needs to kill themselves. I don't know, I think it's that little voice crack that really makes it for me. So as some of you may know, it took two years for 13 Reasons Why to cut their controversial suicide scene, which showed Hannah Baker taking her own life in excruciating and, some argued, triggering detail. But even now, with the scene cut, the first season is still criticized by some for romanticizing Hannah Baker's choice to kill herself, a perception that may be aided by the amount of time spent on her decision and how it was reached. Degrassi High takes the opposite approach from the first cut of 13 Reasons Why. We don't really get Claude's motivation for what he does. 
We see things that may have contributed. He's isolated, unheard, and pretty much invisible at school. When he auditions for the talent show with a poem that expresses his feelings of ideation, he's rejected outright. But even the note he sends to Caitlin doesn't give much information on why he did it. The show instead chooses to focus on the impact of what he does. We never see the act. We just see Snake discover Claude in the bathroom, which is definitely the most horrific part of the two-parter for me. It's really stark and grounded and really scary. Actually, Snake finding the body is going to continue to affect Snake for the rest of the series. It's even brought up in later seasons of The Next Generation. Snake, like, stops going to school for a while and kind of cuts himself off from his friends, just freaked out. But really, everyone at school is affected by the event, as we get to see how it impacts the entire student body. Here, Degrassi pulls a classic move, showing the students debating what happened, each expressing their differing opinions. I said he probably did it here just to make us all feel bad. Oh, that's really nice. Look, I'm sorry. I know it sounds insensitive. But I'm mad at him. I mean, what a jerk. How could you be so cruel? The scenes where everyone shares their different ideas is something that's kind of a Degrassi staple. When discussing a controversial issue, there will be a round table of students all expressing different opinions. In the documentary Degrassi Between Takes, there's actually a moment like this in real life after the actors have read through a scene discussing racism. Do you believe that racism still exists today. Are we dealing oh, with an oh, issue no. or are we dealing with a non-issue? No. <laughs> you know what she's doing right now? Right. It's not really rebelling, in my opinion, because she doesn't stand up to her parents. Right. She's just going to hide it. Yeah. And it's not hard to do that. Maybe BLT if she, should Maybe that would be the better thing to no, do. No, but if no, she was... Oh, or she could end up standing up to him that way without me having to say anything. Yeah, but she's still like... No, and she goes, no, she and, and then BLT like, she said okay, just... that, I don't care. All of the actors got to express their opinion on the scene, racism in society, and voice how they may have handled the situation. The writers then went back and fine-tuned some of the dialogue, and I wonder if that's how some of these scenes, such as this one about suicide and the one about abortion, were written, allowing real-world views of real teens to be expressed. As I said, this style of scene is almost a trope in Degrassi, being used for more controversial and hard-hitting episodes, including in The Next Generation. In these episodes, characters express their anger, disbelief, and confusion about why anyone would do what Claude did. There are very few people who stick up for him or come from a place of empathy, which is kind of hard to watch, but also understandable given that he did it on school property and the impact that is going to have on so many of the students. Claude is shown to have one friend who was particularly affected. The rest of the two-parter shows students struggling with their possible roles in Claude's death and how to move forward. For example, the directors of the talent show feel guilty for rejecting him when it's clear in hindsight that his poem was a cry for help and debate canceling the show altogether, which is a controversial move and a lot of students have different opinions about it. Caitlin has a particularly complicated reaction to his death, given that she's his ex-girlfriend and continually rejected his advances for contact, and she received the closest thing to a note he sent anyone. And in the end, Joey comforts her and tries to ease her own feelings of survivor's guilt. I'm really not an expert in things like this, so I can't say how well Degrassi handled it. I will say it's the heaviest Degrassi classic has ever felt to me, and considering that this is a series that covers HIV and later drunk driving, that's saying a lot. So uh, let's end with a fun fact. <laughs> Actually, this is actually a not-so-fun fact. The Degrassipedia mentions that this is the first of five times that someone will bring a gun to Degrassi. I had honestly forgotten it was so many times. All right, moving on to a place where we don't need content warnings as far as I can tell. Wheels! It's our boy. Did you miss him? So Wheels hasn't popped up a lot. He doesn't do much in season one, normal teenage boy stuff. He plays with his band, he kissed Heather, and in a cute moment, he taught the boys how to use deep breathing to calm themselves before finals, a skill that he says he learned in group therapy. The first time I watched this, I thought, oh, hey, he's learning techniques in group. He's stable with his buddies. Maybe he's doing better. He's climbing out of the depression he suffered from after his parents died. No, <laughs> he's not. I genuinely hate to say this because I love Wheels, y'all, but in Degrassi High, Wheels sucks. Wheels' main storyline is about refusing to take responsibility. We saw shades of that in Degrassi Junior High, but in high school, Wheels uses his parents' death to shield him from any criticism he gets. Even his friends start to get sick of it. He starts acting out more and more, and then, one night, he lies to his grandmother about going to study when he's really going to see a concert with the boys. Of course, Joey Jeremiah's crappy little car breaks down in the middle of nowhere, and Wheels flips out. He yells at Joey for having a bad car and taking a short 
shortcut that put them out in the boonies and basically blames everyone but himself for the fact that he's about to get majorly busted for lying to his grandma. His friends are like done with him and when he finally gets home, things blow up as expected and he gets kicked out. He moves in with Joey for a bit, a tough move since Joey is pissed about him about the night before, but he convinced his friend to let him stay for just a few days. But a few days turns into a few months, and after getting caught stealing money from Joey's mom, he's kicked out of there too. He tries calling his grandma, but his grandma knows about what he did, and is like, nah, I'm not gonna let you here. He's out of options and is basically forced to sleep on Snake's porch, as Snake's parents don't want him in the house. He basically loses any goodwill he had left with his friends, and is left alone for a little while. Eventually, Joey and Wheels do make up in the aftermath of Claude's death, but his storyline doesn't really actually find a conclusion until the film. Because, um, for some reason, Degrassi High ends at season two. In the final episode of Degrassi High, Dwayne reveals to his friends that he has HIV, Joey and Caitlin go to the spring dance together, and it's announced that Degrassi High is closing. I can't find any reason for this online. The oldest students in the show are all only juniors, and so they could have made at least one more season about their senior year. Degrassi High was doing big numbers on prime time, but for some reason, I don't know why, they just cut it off here. Except, there is a movie. But first, the lightning round. I'm running through these quick, but I know some of y'all will be disappointed if I don't mention some of these plot points, so let's go. The Zits want to shoot a music video and Lucy is their director. She refuses to film anything sexist though, which kills Joey's idea of having bikini girls on a car. There are a couple of episodes where the Zits run ideas by her before they finally film one of the most iconic music videos of all time. Everybody get ready and get into gear. The the one and only. The are here. So look, I like this for a very particular reason. When I was a teenager, I used to record my friends and I running around in the park, occasionally trying to make something cool or interesting. Like one time I made a slush show commercial during the viral ARG marketing campaign for the Cloverfield movie. Don't look, you're not gonna find it. <laughs> this just has that same energy and I can't get over it. It Creeps is a banger episode of the first season, 10 out of 10, where Lucy makes a horror movie. It's a fun reversal on slasher movie tropes, so a woman is the killer this time. Honestly, it's a truly entertaining episode with some great moments, even though the boys are super annoying sometimes, being needlessly sexist about how unbelievable it is that a guy could be overpowered by a woman. In the end, everyone's laughing at Lucy's horror movie, which is not exactly the reaction she wanted, but they clearly love it, and I think that also captures that feeling of making videos as a teenager. Doing drugs. Okay, it's smoking weed. Y'all, this episode is wonderful. It follows two different sleepovers, the boys and the girls. The boys are just playing cards and having a wholesome time, while the girls smoke weed and make a big ruckus. There's a great, honestly super realistic portrayal of the way that some people are their first time getting high. I don't feel anything. It's my birthday. How come I don't feel anything? Guys. <laughs> But even funnier and sadder is the way Melanie outs Kathleen's issues to the rest of the girls. Have you ever read anyone's diary? Yes. Kathleen's, of course. (laughs) But it was okay, because I know it came out that she had anorexia and she got canceling. (laughs) Melanie? Kathleen, I don't see what the big deal is. You had anorexia. Your mom is an alcoholic and your boyfriend beat you up. Most people would need counseling for even one of those things. Like, I joke about how much shit this show piles on Kathleen, and then the show just goes and lampshades it like that. It's both funny and kind of sad. I really love it. Disability. Kathleen, Melanie, and Diana all want to go to a movie and decide that because the theater they're going to is not wheelchair accessible, they're just not going to invite their friend Maya, who is in a wheelchair, since they don't want to make her feel left out. Maya rightfully chews them out for this. She says that they could have gone to a different theater and her mom would have driven them, but instead they just assumed she couldn't go and showed their ableism. I effing loved this moment. It was such a surprise the last time I watched it. It's super believable. The girls seem to think they're doing the right thing because they're just gonna make her feel left out if they invite her, but really what they're doing is removing her agency and underestimating what she can do. Maya has absolutely no patience for it and I love it. Maya is in a lot more 
more of this show, by the way. And I wish she got more storylines to herself. It's like deeply unfair that she didn't and just kind of had to play second fiddle to Caitlyn for a lot of it. Whatever. Another sexism episode. I feel like the early seasons of Degrassi were like really obsessed with sexism. This one is another boys versus girls sports situation. In this case, the boys, I think basketball team, are getting preferential treatment on the gym because the school is promoting boys basketball over girls volleyball. The story that takes place in this one is that Lucy likes a guy and is afraid that being like a strong, independent, outspoken woman is going to jeopardize her chances with him. And like, it turns out that it does, but in the end, she doesn't care and decides to fight for what she believes in, which obviously rules. But the best part about it is that Bronco, this guy who is the school president, is super into it. He's like, wow, cool, pretty, smart, outspoken girl. Love it. And uh, so they end up going out and it's wonderful. Editing cat here is something I forgot to mention in the lightning round. I didn't talk a lot about Spike this video because she basically just like struggles with having a boyfriend and that's kind of her storyline. Um, but I did want to mention that there is a moment late, late in the second season in which Spike is daydreaming about going out with Snake. And so this is the first moment that we get that Spike has a crush on Snake, I think. And it's just a really cute scene. And I thought I would throw it in as a tiny bit of foreshadowing except for some stuff that's going to be happening in the next generation. So yeah, I had to throw that in. And I love that. That's so much fun. And I fully believe that Spike would be into Snake. I actually, anytime someone has a crush on Snake, I totally get it. So yeah. <laughs> 10 out of 10. Honestly, that's it for the lightning round this time. I might have missed some stuff, but honestly, I covered most of the characters last time and a lot of storylines are just carried over and I already talked about them. So let's get into School's Out. School's Out was a Degrassi made-for-TV movie that was released in 1992. It did effing gangbusters, drawing 2.2 million viewers, which is like double what Degrassi the TV show had been getting before. It also goes hard. Somewhat famously, it's the first use of the F word on Canadian primetime television, and it was our boy Snake who got to say it, followed almost immediately by Caitlin saying it, but Snake still got there first. The writers at the time felt the need to justify their use of the word as it making sense in the moment, you know, the way teenagers would speak. And you know what? It did. It's iconic. I'm gonna say right now that if you're expecting me to rip into this one, you're gonna be disappointed. There are some really good criticisms of this movie and I will address some of them at the end, but for the most part, I kind of love it. It's a big campy summer bop, which might account for why some people didn't like it initially. Apparently it originally aired in January, which is the exact opposite time for a fun in the sun swimsuit movie to air. The movie tries to portray the teens' lives outside of school for the first time with an emphasis on how it feels to be moving on from high school. So I'm really biased. That summer between high school and college is crystallized in my own mind exactly the way the show tries to capture it here. And so part of my enjoyment from this movie comes from nostalgia. Not nostalgia for that time period, because I was like three when this movie came out, but for the way it captures the feeling of the last summer after high school. Classic Degrassi just has a knack for capturing that feeling, and I think that remains true whether or not you enjoy the actual plot of the movie. And I will say, I don't super love the plot. So for those who don't know, let's recap. You may have guessed that School's Out takes place in the summer after the older set of kids have graduated from high school. This means there's a jump of a year between the last episode of Degrassi High and this film, skipping a lot of the characters' senior years in high school. So needless to say, some development has happened while we were away. Lucy and Caitlin have become good friends, and Caitlin took extra classes in order to graduate early with Lucy, who she's going to be rooming with in college. They're going to a school where they can do journalism and film studies together. Joey got a better, less shitty car, Wheels got a job at an auto shop, some My Little Pony levels of name dictating profession there, by the way, and Tessa Campanelli started dating some guy named Todd. Oh, right, let's rewind. <laughs> So I haven't talked about Tessa Campanelli very much, and that's mostly because I love her. She's cute and fun, and I wish she got interesting stories, but for the most part, she basically just dates boys and frets about it. And while these stories have a place in the series, I just don't really feel the need to recap them. Her page on what I'm calling the Degrassipedia says this. She is one of Degrassi's most developed characters, starting off as a childish, immature, hyperactive grade 7 who was only taller than Scooter Webster by an inch, but evolves into a beautiful, mature, yet aggressively promiscuous young woman. Like, who wrote this? Tessa herself? 
I don't even think it's true that she's that promiscuous, but whatever. It is true from what we see in Degrassi High that Tessa has a crush on every boy. I have a crush on every boy! Arrowed! She has a huge crush on Joey, but Arthur sets her up with his buddy Alex through the clever use of phony secret admirer notes. Somehow this works, and Tessa dates Alex for a while, during which there's like a cute storyline where Alex doesn't know how to read if Tessa wants him to kiss her. Which is why we teach kids about just asking for consent, by the way. It would prevent both this awkwardness with Alex, as well as that earlier scene with Liz. Just ask your partner if they want you to kiss them. It's okay to do that. Anyway, after a while, Tessa starts to stale on Alex and gets real dreamy about Yik Yu. Based on the comments underneath any episode that Yik ever appears in in Degrassi High, Tessa is not alone in finding him attractive, by the way. Some of y'all need Jesus. Tessa and Alex break up at the tail end of the series, and Tessa is seen dancing with Yik at the final dance. But after the time jump, as I said, she's dating some new guy named Todd, who I guess doing some research was in the show, but I genuinely couldn't tell you anything about about him. In my mind, he shows up for like a second in the movie and then disappears forever. Oh, Todd, we barely knew you. You liked smoking weed and telling your girlfriend she's a drag. Rest in peace. I gather that his actor has done well for himself, though, so good job. So the movie starts out with the older class graduating, which basically means Lucy, Wheels, Snake, the twins, Alexa, Simon... <laughs> Okay, wait, sorry. Let's take another brief detour into Alexa and Simon Corner. I mentioned them briefly, not by name, in my last video. Alexa is the one who bought Steph's risque clothes in order to draw attention of a boy they both liked, Simon. In the end, even though Alexa had to give the clothes back to Steph, she got to keep the boy. Alexa and Simon would continue to date through the rest of the series. They basically show up in places as a unit. Alexa and Simon, and occasionally have silly drama, like Alexa forcing Simon to say she's overweight and then losing her mind about thinking he's gonna leave her for being too fat before putting her foot down and saying, she doesn't care if he cares if she's fat, he has to deal with it anyway. And he's like, I didn't even think you were fat, you just kinda, uh. Like poor Simon, he didn't ask for this. The kid is basically a saint, and while I cannot fathom why he puts up with it, he does. And he and Alexa basically have the most stable relationship in the whole show. In one of the early scenes in the movie, after graduation, Simon asks Alexa to marry him, and she says yes. Boy Meets World style. Simon and Alexa versus Cory and Topanga. Leave it in the comments. A group, including Caitlin and Lucy, gossip about getting married out of high school, with Caitlin saying it's a really stupid idea. But, of course, unbeknownst to her, Joey has bought a ring and prepared a proposal as well. So, Joey didn't graduate. Remember, he was held back in junior high and so was behind Wheels and Snake the whole time they were in high school. Caitlin was in his class, but she took extra classes in order to graduate early, so now Joey is afraid of being left alone. Also, he really, really wants to get laid, and I think he thinks that getting engaged might be the thing that lights a fire in Caitlin for that one. So Caitlin turns down his proposal. I mean, it would be pretty hypocritical of her not to, I guess. And Joey, dejected, leaves the party. Tessa, who had a fight with her boyfriend, is leaving at the same time, and Joey offers her a ride. Uh-oh. Maybe I'll see where this is going. So this is why a lot of people criticize this movie. The plot is basically a love triangle slash summer fling movie in which Joey cheats on longtime love interest Caitlin with Tessa. Or, in the words of Snake, Joey Jeremiah spends his summer dating Caitlin. Shut up. And fucking Tessa. Joey spends the summer and the length of the movie lying to both girls. Tessa and he have a thing in a window when I think Joey genuinely thinks that he and Caitlin are going to break up, but then he refuses to dump her when they get back together, mostly because he seems drawn to Tessa physically. Caitlin never even knew about the thing with Tessa, and it's not like he's gonna tell her. He basically spends the summer trying to get in both of their pants and juggling around their different work schedules. As for Tessa, she basically believes that Joey and Caitlin are doomed to break up for good when Caitlin leaves for school in the fall, and so she doesn't believe that Joey and Caitlin's current off-again status is going to turn back on again. So when she starts getting serious with Joey, it's because she thinks that they're going to go long-term. And I want to be honest here. I really like the Joey-Tessa chemistry. The montages with them are cute, but the scene where they finally have sex is genuinely one of the most compelling bits of romance in the whole show. It's like way better than anything Joey and Caitlin ever do, in my opinion. So since Joey is getting his, uh, needs met by Tessa, he's suddenly really understanding and sweet with Caitlin, not pressuring her anymore. 
Caitlin finds this as evidence that Joey has grown and matured and has sex with him on his 19th birthday without realizing that it's not his first time. Because of his sudden maturity and choosing to have sex with him, Caitlin secretly decides to change her plans, go to school nearby, and stay near Joey. Tessa is also keeping secrets, finding out she's pregnant, and quietly getting an abortion without telling him. When she finally finds out about his lies after calling him on his birthday and finds out he's been seeing Caitlin behind her back, she responds appropriately and dumps him. Which brings us to the lake party. So before we actually talk about the lake party, I have to talk about some other stuff that happens in this movie, because it's not just Joey shenanigans. There are a couple subplots happening at the same time as the big storyline with Joey. The other storylines are about the zits, of course. Snake gets a job as a lifeguard, hoping it will lead to him finally losing his virginity, but all it really does is put him near a bunch of women in bikinis to torture him all summer. He becomes more and more frustrated, especially as his friends tease him about not getting laid, and Joey continues to brag about how much he's getting from Tessa Campanelli. Wheels buys and starts repairing a car, hoping to get it in good shape by the fall so he can go on a cross-country trip while his friends are in school. Xander style. <laughs> Why did I write that? The last thing I need to do is out myself as a Buffy fan. <laughs> One big change to Wheels in this movie is his drinking. Earlier in the series, we see him choose to turn down a beer, even after being offered one multiple times. When pressed, he finally tells his friends that because his parents were hit by a drunk driver, he's not comfortable drinking. Since then, something has changed, and Wheels has gone from teetotaler to drinking three beers in an afternoon and then suggesting they all go for a joyride in his car. Snake scolds him for this, but it doesn't really land. Wheels hasn't changed much since we last saw him, and he still refuses to take responsibility or listen to any of his friends' criticisms. All of this leads to the lake scene, which is what I always think of when I think of this movie. It might as well be Degrassi, the lake party. <laughs> It's so quintessentially Degrassi. I love it. So Lucy and Bronco hold a party at a lake house, a kind of last hurrah before everyone leaves for school in the fall. The party starts out well, but quickly shifts to the wrong foot. Joey announces his engagement to Caitlin, who has abruptly decided to say yes. This, along with Joey continuing to tease Snake for still being a virgin, pisses Snake off. Understandably, he thinks Joey is being a total tool by cheating on two girls all summer and insinuates that if Joey keeps pushing his buttons, he's gonna let Joey's secret out. And in front of Caitlyn, no less. Also, for no reason at all, I also just want to say that in this scene, he's wearing the same shirt that he wears on the cover of his book. This has no relevance. It's just a thing I noticed. <laughs> After Joey and Snake's confrontation, Wheels, a few beers in at this point, has no sympathy for Snake's position, saying that Snake's going to university, he has two loving parents, blah blah blah, and that he needs to grow up. Snake blows up at him, calling him self-pitying and causing the two to get into a fight that almost gets physical. Lucy and Bronco separate them, and Lucy asks Wheels to drive with her to go get chips, mostly as a way to de-escalate the situation. We see them get into the car, a beer in Wheels' hand. The next few bits are wonderful, I love them, because it's just a really fun take on wild teen parties that doesn't feel too out there. People are just like hanging out, drinking and smoking, getting a little rowdy, but without it being fully unbelievable. Alexa and Simon get into a very Alexa and Simon argument about wedding showers, and Alexa complains that Simon has cold feet, and Simon says the best line, Jeez, would you listen to me for a change? Some people who have had a little too much to drink stumble into a canoe and scream as they get wet. Folks sit on the grass and share some kind of cigarette of ambiguous origin. <laughs> It's really nice. In the midst of all this fun, Joey goes into the house to confront Snake, who's been brooding in the living room this whole time. Joey tells Snake that if he almost tells on him again, he's gonna kill him, and Snake loses it. He's totally done. He goes off, in his words, recapping the Jeremiah summer by loudly proclaiming that Joey has been cheating all summer, which Caitlin, of course, overhears. Tessa Campanelli? You were fucking Tessa Campanelli? The secret's out. Caitlin tells Joey that she had been planning on staying, but now they're through and locks herself in the bedroom. Classic teen drama move. It's not a party unless someone is crying in the bedroom. Meanwhile, outside, the canoe has flipped over and someone has started drowning. It's Snake's moment. His lifeguard training kicking in, Snake jumps in without a second thought. A super dramatic scene follows. Nothing like Snake's fantasies about saving hot women at the pool, Snake pulls the girl to shore. As everyone praises him and calls him a hero, he sits in shock, unable to fully process what happened. I actually think 
that this might relate to his trauma about finding Claude. Remember that Snake stopped coming to school and had a really hard time after that, so I wonder if facing death here again, he has some lingering PTSD that really affects him. As the camera zooms in on Snake's shocked face, we hear someone, maybe Bronco, ask if anyone knows where Lucy is. Cutting immediately to the scene of a wreck with wheels, shaky and bloodied, surrounded by emergency workers. This is easily the most memorable part of the movie to me. Wheels, drunk drives. So my former experience with this idea when I was a teenager was an episode of The Next Generation. My knowledge of Degrassi Classic as a teen basically extended to the episodes that aired on PBS when I was at my dad's in the summer. To be honest, they were almost totally disconnected in my mind from the TV show I watched in the inn as a middle schooler. So when Wheels showed up in season three of The Next Generation, I was fascinated. This guy shows up in the middle of this big cancer storyline to drop some serious capital L lore. I was drunk. I drove. I killed a kid. I was enraptured. Who was this guy? What had happened? The original Degrassi had a drunk driving episode? It wasn't until years later that I watched the show for real, and the whole time with the knowledge that at some point, this character was gonna kill a kid. So imagine my surprise when it happens in like the last 10 minutes of the series. Like the whole time I'm waiting for this thing. And as the show went on, I just keep thinking, when's it gonna happen? Does it happen? Did the next generation just make something up? But even wilder than Degrassi tacking on a lesson about drunk driving at the end of the show is the fact that it's this storyline that makes Wheels one of my favorite characters. I genuinely think that his storyline all taken together start to finish, is incredibly compelling. The death of his parents at the hand of a drunk driver starts him down the path that will lead to him doing the inverse, leaving a family without a kid. I mean, it's not perfect by any means. The storyline itself has problems. After the accident, which not only kills a child, but also leaves Lucy temporarily blind and unable to walk, Wheels is sent to jail off screen. The party abruptly ends, cutting instead to Joey visiting Wheels, where he tells Joey that being in prison is, and I quote, no joke. Yeah, Wheels, no kidding. He lays out the charges against him. Criminal negligence causing death, criminal negligence causing injury, and drunk driving. And still, still, behind bars, and knowing that he was at the wheel of a car that killed a child, he cannot take responsibility. It wasn't my fault that kid wasn't wearing a seatbelt, he says. It wasn't my fault Lucy wanted chips. It's really hard to watch. Especially when the movie cuts back to Lucy, and a grim reminder that whatever Wheels meant to do, he ended up killing one person and possibly ruining the future of another. Like, low-key, Lucy is probably my actual favorite character in the show. At least, in my opinion, she might be, like, she might be the best. She has a passion for filmmaking that we see throughout her run in Degrassi High, and unlike Joey and the Zits, she works hard and strives to get better. No offense to the Zits, but, like, they're fully oblivious to how bad they are. <laughs> She's a really strong character. She's shown from the jump as being highly independent and self-motivated, a trait partially caused by being left alone for long periods of time as a kid. When the movie hangs out for a bit, letting you wonder if Lucy is going to stay blind and unable to walk, it's really gut-wrenching. Luckily, Lucy does end up on the mend. The epilogue of the movie takes place at Simon and Alexa's wedding a few months later. We get the general where are they now of a bunch of different characters. Lucy's getting better, Heather fell in love with some guy, and Paraguay or whatever. Caitlin started journalism school and Snake finally got a girlfriend. Probably my favorite moment is when Snake and Joey kind of make up. After Joey visited Wheels, he tried to make things right with Snake, but Snake just wasn't having it. He left for college without a proper goodbye. Now, with time, the two are actually able to forgive each other, though Snake still hasn't reached out to Wheels. And, uh, spoilers, he won't for a really long time. Wheels has changed, though, Joey says. In a moment that I really appreciate as someone who likes watching Wheels' arc, we find out that he pled guilty to all charges and is going to be in jail for a long time. I always took this as his first step toward taking responsibility and making real changes in his life. Though that's really up for interpretation. So I just realized that I finished this section without writing up any kind of summary. My general thoughts on the movie is that it's really worth watching at least one time. This second time watching it, I found the stuff with Joey cheating to be so difficult to watch that I skimmed through that part a little bit, but I watched it in about May-ish, which is right as it was really warming up here where I live and starting to feel like summer, and it was like a really fun summer movie. There were parts that were genuinely entertaining, although of course the ending is pretty bleak. But since it's basically the cap for the series, I highly recommend it, even if it's just kind of to see what happens with the characters. Epilogue. 
Where are they now? And that's Degrassi High. There was a little TV show that aired after the movie called Degrassi Talks, in which the actors of Degrassi High interviewed teenagers about the kinds of subjects they touched on in the show. I don't have a lot to say about this. I haven't watched it much, but it seems like an interesting peek into what teenagers were dealing with in the 90s, so that's fun. I mainly mention it because one, it's part of the Degrassi canon, I guess. And uh, two, because the theme song is, again, buck wild. It was apparently written by the actor who played Tim, Keith White and Caitlin's actress Stacy Mistison lead the vocal track. Even I can't defend this one. I love 90s cheese, but come on. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, I'm just generally not going to talk about the actors and their later careers. If you're interested, you can look into it, but for the most part, it's actually just not super interesting. There are a few standout actors who would go on to reprise their roles in The Next Generation, though some also had sort of sadder trajectories. Listen, I'm just warning you, the first time I finished Degrassi High, I looked up all the actors and checked in on them, and it basically bummed me out for the rest of the week, so I'm genuinely just trying to save you from that. <laughs> I can talk about what happened with some of the characters, though, as well as lay out where the show was right before its revival. What we do know about what happened with the characters mostly comes from the first few episodes of Degrassi The Next Generation, the episode one reunion. Most of the scenes that I'm talking about were deleted scenes that were then put on the DVD or were not aired in the US, but you can still find them on YouTube. They're mostly a riot and kind of amazing. For some reason, they always strike me as improvised, like the actors were told to give their characters their own endings or something. They're mostly recorded as reunion slash yearbook style videos in which the characters talk directly to the camera and tell us about how their lives have been in the 10 years since we last saw them. So the first notable character that we run into is Dwayne. I actually shrieked when I saw him for the first time. I was so thrilled. Uh, he actually jokes when he first shows up, surprised to see me, and explains that he is HIV positive, but still AIDS free. So that's where I used to beat up Joey, right over there. <laughs> and he says that he'll see us in 10 years too. So this is like a really phenomenal, uplifting ending. You know, at the time that Degrassi High aired, HIV really did feel like a death sentence for some people, but that was like the start of a turning point, especially if you were like Dwayne and you had like a lot of resources at your disposal. I mean, Dwayne wasn't exactly utilizing his resources at the time that we saw him, but it does seem like he probably has options. And so by the time Degrassi The Next Generation aired in 2001, HIV was so much less of a death sentence. So it's really exciting to see him here. Kathleen shows up and she is an outdoorsy traveler type who is now pitching her own Canadian travel show. Yik Yu shows up here. Again, cute people typing glow up in the comments. He's there with Arthur, who we don't see here, but I think we see in a wide shot later, who he says is still his partner after all these years. He then clarifies that they run a web design company together, but um, you can't convince me that they're not gay. Sorry. Uh, we see Alexa, and she's super pregnant with she and Simon's third kid, so they're obviously still going strong. She, like, makes a point about how he's still the cutest, which is just, I mean, couple's goals, I guess. We see Liz and she tells us that she works with people with mental disabilities. This will actually change later in the next generation to her being a midwife, but like, she can be both. <laughs> also, we see Mr. Radich, who I don't think I've mentioned at all in this video yet. Mr. Radich came with the students, sort of George Feeney style, and became the vice principal at Degrassi High. But anyway, Radich is here and he is now the principal of Degrassi Community School. And while these little scenes are great, they are not the bread and butter of what we will get to know about what happens with our characters. A large part of the main characters in Degrassi High and Degrassi Junior High that I haven't mentioned actually get proper epilogues within the storylines of Degrassi The Next Generation. Spike, Lucy, and Wheels will all have their moments. Snake becomes a teacher at Degrassi Community School. Joey shows up as running a used car lot, which seems to be going pretty well for him. And Spike is, as I mentioned in the last video, the mother of who is positioned to be sort of the main character in early Degrassi The Next Generation. So Spike is still around and raising her daughter. When we see Lucy in the reunion episode of The Next Generation, she can see fine and is able to walk with the assistance of a cane. It seems like she stayed in Toronto. I'm not sure it's ever made clear what she was doing, but at the start of Degrassi The Next Generation, she's actually moving to the United States and Joey is attempting to sell her a car to get her there. Caitlin Ryan is now a famous news reporter and host of worldwide acclaimed television show Ryan's World, which 
which covers environmental topics primarily. And I guess she's supposed to be akin to something like, I don't know, like a Katie Couric type. She's absolutely the most sort of traditionally successful of the main group, going back to my idea that I think maybe the writers liked her the best. At the start of Degrassi The Next Generation, she is not only the host of a big famous show, but is also engaged to some big shot Hollywood producer. But you know what? I can't get too deep into that without talking more about The Next Generation. And uh, honestly, that's where we leave our characters. Oh, wheels. <laughs> the fact is, I didn't know this until really recently, but in my research, I discovered a deleted scene that doesn't appear on a lot of deleted scene compilations that I've watched. What I found is that this scene was deleted from the American release, although it seems like it did air on CTV. So in this scene, Wheels shows up at the reunion and asks Mr. Radich to go inside to get Lucy so that he can apologize to her one-on-one. -on -one. I think this is supposed to be cementing the idea that I was talking about earlier, which is that Wheels started to take responsibility when he was in prison. He apologizes to Lucy and takes responsibility for injuring her and for killing a kid, basically saying a thing that he will go on to say in another episode of the same series, which is just sort of a blunt statement of fact. I drank, I drove, I killed a kid. No excuses, no, the kid wasn't wearing a seatbelt, just I did this thing. He does center himself a little bit by saying that Lucy doesn't know how he's paying for it every single day, but you know what? I have to imagine that if you're responsible for the death of the kid, you probably do think about it pretty often. There's a weird moment at the end of the scene where Wheels walks away and Lucy tells Radish that she feels sorry for him. I'm not really sure how we're supposed to feel about this scene. Like, are we supposed to feel sorry for Wheels? I mean, he was 19 when he screwed up and he basically lost everything. And fair enough. I don't know, I think if you drink and drive, something should be done about it. But he did lose his friends and all of his support structure, which basically left him completely alone. But at the same time, Wheels is just reaping what he sowed throughout all of Degrassi High from his behavior. What happened to Wheels was sort of at the end of a long line of poor choices and behaviors. And it's hard not to feel as though his friends probably would have given more chances had he not already used them all up beforehand. Perhaps the scene was deleted simply because it was so confusing and morally ambiguous. Because honestly, that remains one of the things that I like most about Degrassi High. The episodes where they're not trying to make a clear point, but where they offer a number of different suggestions and viewpoints are often the strongest to me. One of the things I hear the most when people criticize the movie is that it takes a very understandably strong stance in a number of places, moralizing against Joey Jeremiah cheating on his girlfriend in wheels drunk driving. And these are things that are very easy to condemn. And while I think the movie makes a valiant effort to try and show the reality of the people who make these choices and, and maybe make them easier to empathize with. When wheels drinking and driving ends with the death of an innocent child, it's hard not to see that as just sort of the end of your typical morality play. And the very worst possible consequence of that bad thing has now occurred. Degrassi, and especially Degrassi Classic, is at its best when it's showing the moral ambiguity. While it's true that the show often shows the possible worst case consequences for behavior, it somehow usually managed to steer away from feeling like it was talking down to its audience, at least in my opinion. Often the kids were able to figure out why their choices were somehow misguided or skewed without having to reap the actual worst case consequences. Another thing the show does sometimes that I really like is showing kids doing basically everything right, but something still going wrong. For example, when Kathleen breaks up with her boyfriend and then still has to deal with his harassment harassment and abuse. Not everything is perfect and black and white in this world. So I think one of the best things that Degrassi Junior High and Degrassi High ended up doing was showing a real spectrum of life. Sometimes really terrible things happen when you make mistakes and sometimes you can just skirt by with just the bare minimum of bad things happening. Going forward, I think the next generation takes this idea and flips it in a lot of ways. While there's still a spectrum of what can happen when you make bad choices, Degrassi the next generation really leans into a spectrum of bad things that can happen when you make the exact right choices or maybe just misinformed choices. But I guess that's for the next video. So I really hope that y'all have enjoyed listening to me ramble on about Degrassi Classic. Like, frankly, it was so much more fun than I could have imagined. Uh, when I went back and rewatched this show during quarantine, I was surprised at just how good it was. Like, I remembered it being good and I remember thinking, oh, it's better than I thought it was going to be. But this time watching it, I was just actually blown away. And I loved how much you could see the groundwork being laid for later TV shows. And I hope y'all found something interesting in here too. So I'm not 100% sure how I'm going to be doing Degrassi The Next Generation videos. If you know, it's uh, a million seasons long. I think it's like 14 or 15 seasons and that's not including the next class, which I would actually like to cover. So um, I have a lot of 
television to watch ahead of me. Um, I'm thinking that I'm either going to break up the next generation into seasons. So do like one or two seasons at a time or do like eras maybe. So I can't like, I can't particularly think of what the eras might be, but like an example would be like, the spinner and page dating era or something like that, right? Um, so if you have any suggestions for like what little eras could be, like at max three seasons, um, give me suggestions below. <laughs> I'm just gonna try and split them up. But uh, if I can't do that, then I'm just gonna do like one or two seasons at a time. And uh, I hope that that's something that's interesting to you. If you have any other ideas for things that I should watch, especially like teen drama type things, then uh, let me know in the comments. And if you wanna see more, like and subscribe. Thank you again for all your support. I really appreciate it so much. And um, until next time, I hope you have a great day.